Hi guys, a short video for a niche audience. Partial telephone line simulation. Enough to connect a pair of old dial-up modems back to back to make communication or a pair of old telephones for use as an intercom. Another video that I didn't really know what to do with. It could have been part of the Scion series because this is a Scion PDA travel modem. It is pretty much standard but it's an IRDA communication uh, between the PDA and the modem rather than a wired serial port. But I'll have a different type of wired modem to use that in the Scion series if I want to do that anyway. In a previous video I used this cheap nasty Pendo laptop to demonstrate a program that needed XP to run it and that's been upgraded to this IBM ThinkPad which is also running Windows XP but the important part is it has a built-in 56k dial-up modem. There hasn't been an active landline in this house for quite some time and the last time we had one it was digital so I'm unable to test my new toy the conventional way. The next best method of testing the new modem that comes to mind is connecting it directly with the internal modem in my laptop. There are a few ways this could be achieved and specifically regarding modems the easiest one is with a straight phone cable. You'll have to be lucky and have the right modems for this to work and it's probably most likely if your modems have the extended AT command to select line type. A simple cable will never suffice to get a pair of telephones talking to each other. The next option is a commercial telephone line simulator. The benefit provided by one of these devices is full simulation of the telephone line. You'll have to dial a number which is typically one digit to dial the other phone and the other phone will ring. The downside of this option is that it ranges from being relatively expensive for a device like this one to insanely expensive for a device like this one. Especially considering that these devices are right on the edge of obsolescence. They are out there and commonly available though. For this video I'll settle part way and make a still fairly simple device that looks like this. It won't provide a 100 volt ring signal that will cause a modem to auto answer but they can still communicate. But why does a battery help us here? It's not an amplifier and a battery on its own doesn't just make things work. So at this point I'd like to shift focus away from the dial up modems and back to the old telephones again that the telephone network was designed for in the first place. After all the modem was designed to accommodate the telephone network not the other way around. Well I happen to have a brand new old new old new telephone transducer here microphone. If you've read or watched any sort of tutorial about how a telephone works, the first thing you'd have read is that this microphone converts audio waves into electrical signals. Bow, bow, eh. <laughs> well, the microphone wouldn't have driven the speaker even if it did, that was just a visual aid. But when we connect a 9 volt battery in series between the microphone and the speaker, we get something different. <laughs> A carbon microphone is a very fast variable resistor. Nothing you can do to it will get it to induce any current at all. The microphone encapsulates a bunch of carbon granules between two electrodes which are compressed whenever pressure is applied to the diaphragm. In this state, current finds a shorter path between the two electrodes. In combination with a battery or some other power supply, this rocking back and forth and varying resistance forms a very simple and effective amplifier. If we are marked to die, we are not to do our country loss, but if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honour. Back to dial-up modems, this is a US Robotics 56k external fax modem. Although I never really had reason to test it, this is probably the type that will be able to be operated with a leased line. Or in other words, a straight cable between two modems. But the manufacturer's got plenty of room to shove whatever they like in there, so let's take a look at a newer PCM CIA modem card. Obviously designed for a laptop and offers similar functionality, but they don't get to power this from a 9 volt AC supply. It's got to plug into a laptop and be powered off a single 5 volt rail. Any other power supply that this modem sees comes from the phone line. The connector pins in the red box now are for plugging into an old Nokia phone for a true wireless cellular connection, but we can ignore those for now. The supplied cable for connecting this modem to a phone line doesn't even include these pins at all. The supplied cable for connecting to a phone line will only connect these two pins known as the ring and tip. The same two pins that connect a telephone to the phone line. 
Let's change the orientation of this board and look at it over a light box. Now we can clearly see the isolation on the circuit board between the part of the modem connected to the phone line and everything else. All of this optical isolation allows the modem to work without any electrical connection between your laptop and the phone line at all. This setup exists to protect your expensive laptop from lightning strikes and other irregularities on the phone line. <laughs> Nobody cares about your crappy laptop. It's there to protect the phone network from your junk. Like the junk laptop I showed you four minutes ago and have been passing off as a light box for the last 30 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyway, there's a bunch of active componentry on the phone line side of this modem that isn't getting powered by the laptop. You could probably see at a glance early on how I made the cable. Take an ordinary phone extension cable, cut it clean in half, then strip the wires again and join one straight back together. Then connect a 330 ohm resistor between one side of the battery snap and one wire that is remaining on the phone extension cable. Then there's only two wires left to join straight together. I didn't mention battery polarity because it doesn't matter, you can take your pick. If your phone extension cable has four wires connected through, we're only interested in the middle two. That's the middle two in this example, the red and the green, which really only applies to Australia. Things will be different depending on where you are, or even the age of the sockets you're using. To finish mine off, I've used some PVC tape, both for neatness and to provide a bit of strain relief for the phone cable. This is the basic setup between the two modems, the laptop and the Scion PDA. I'll have to give up this fixed camera jig for some shaky handheld video. I could fix the lighting, but in this fixed camera jig you wouldn't really see anything. Or I can just cram everything into a narrow shot. I was hoping by leaving the modem in the corner of the screen you'd be able to see the data LED flashing with the communication, but I don't think that's going to happen somehow. I'll add a short note about this after, but uh, I'm typing ATD into the hyperterminal program that I want to dial and ATA into the other device that I want to receive the phone call. Although these are both 56k modems, at least one of them has a limited uplink speed and that's why they only connected at 31200 board. Both terminals are displaying practically identical information. The PDA additionally displays the serial connection speed between the PDA and its modem. From here I can start typing on one terminal and characters will appear on the other. The data LED on the modem is flashing whether you can see it or not. And this is just as if the two terminals were connected with a null modem cable. In case anyone wanted to check, this is the front page of the manual that talks about the limited connection speed for the uplink. About that note that I wanted to add, Dial-up modems across all generations don't strictly adhere to the original Hayes AT command set. Most, if not all, by default, will wait for a dial tone before attempting to dial, and a command will have to be entered to get it to disregard the fact that there is no dial tone. I did this off camera and for me the command was ATX1, but for someone else with another modem, that command will be different. And lastly, this video has only scratched the surface about how the telephone communications network works. What you'll really want is a 1959 copy of the PMG training manual. This copy was kindly sent to me by Relay Automatic, a very suggestive name there. This video is minimal and didn't cover the injection of the 100 volt 25 hertz ring signal required to get a modem to auto answer or a telephone to ring. You might have noticed I didn't complete a file transfer between two computers but I think that's best left for another video where I can give it some context or perhaps use the laptop as a server to provide internet access for the PDA. That is all for now though, so I hope you enjoyed the video and catch us next time.